Yes, Kopi Vosian. Good morning, everyone, brothers and sisters. Um, I am Kadazan. That's one of the indigenous people group of Sabah, East Malaysia. You don't know where Sabah is. Maybe you have heard of North Borneo. Yes. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the seventh Emily conference for this uh, for this invitation and this opportunity to share our experience as an indigenous organization. And uh, the topic of my presentation this morning is Bridging Generations, Indigenous Language Empowerment for Sustainability. The, the first part of my presentation is kind of an oral tradition. So um, I invite you all to just relax, sit back, relax, and listen. As we stand in a precipice of a new era in the international decade of indigenous languages, we must recognize the integral role that indigenous languages play in shaping not only cultural identity, but also broader societal sustainability. This is not merely a linguistic endeavor. It is a call to bridge generations, to empower communities, and to align our efforts with the global sustainable agenda. Indigenous languages are more than words and grammar. They are the very fabric of our cultural heritage and social cohesion. They embody wisdom, traditions, and worldviews that are crucial in our journey towards sustainability. The preservation of these languages is not just a matter of linguistics, but a vital component of social justice, environmental stewardship, and cultural continuity. For the background of International Decade of Indigenous Languages, IDIL, yeah, the proclamation of the International Decade of Indigenous Languages by the UN was a monumental step in recognizing the urgency of preserving and revitalizing indigenous languages. So as we approach the first quarter of IDIL, it is imperative not only to reflect on our progress, but also to reiterate our commitment to a broader unified approach that transcends mere language preservation and aligns with the sustainable development goals. Now, the scope of this presentation, this presentation is an exploration, a dialogue, a commitment. It explores the challenges and successes in indigenous communities in Malaysia. In the quest to prepare, in the quest to preserve, and revitalize, revitalize their in heritage languages. Beyond that, it, is, it underscores the intrinsic link between language empowerment and sustainability, seeking a future where indigenous languages are not only maintained, but thrive as catalysts for social, economic, and environmental well-being. for the challenges and opportunities. So continue this oral tradition. The current state of indigenous languages, particularly in regions like Asia, presents a stark picture with 81% of languages in Malaysia classified as in trouble or dying. The situation is critical, but not irreparable. The challenge is indeed complex, as the presence of major languages often place indigenous languages in the periphery. However, these heritage languages serve as the lifeblood of culture and identity for countless individuals and community. As such, they deserve national attention and commitment. If we view language survival, through the lens of competition, it becomes evident 
that indigenous languages often lack the resources and platforms to compete on a level playing field. This is not a call for division, but rather a heartfelt plea for unity in which the government plays an instrumental role in ensuring that each language and culture within our diverse nation has the opportunity to flourish and contribute to our collective tapestry. The time for action is now to nurture these linguistic treasures as integral components of our national language, uh, our national heritage. The challenges faced by indigenous languages are multifaceted, stemming from the lack of intergenerational transmission and the absence of these languages in formal and non-formal education. This can be seen in the alarming statistics that reveal how many indigenous languages are at risk or in trouble across various Asian countries. Debates around the role of major languages have often neglected the importance of indigenous languages, overshadowing the urgency of their preservation. Yet these challenges are not in some mountable and with strategic collaboration and re renewed focus, we can reverse this troubling trend. While the challenge, challenges are significant, the current decade presents us with an unparalleled opportunities through a concerted collaboration between policymakers and indigenous communities, we can achieve the objective of the UN Sustainable Development Goals in relation to indigenous languages and contribute to sustainability in a broader context by working hand in hand, respecting the wisdom of indigenous communities and leveraging the resources and influence of policy structures, we can create a framework where languages not only survive, but flourish, enhancing our cultural richness and building a more inclusive and sustainable world. It is a vision that requires partnership and perseverance, but one that is both hopeful and attainable. The mother tongue based multilingual education, MTB MLE, is more than just an educational approach. It is a pathway to empowerment, understanding and identity by emphasizing the use of indigenous languages in education, MTB MLE connects learners with their cultural roots, improves comprehension, and fosters a sense of pride in their heritage. It is an approach that recognizes the intrinsic value of indigenous languages, not merely as subjects to be learned, but as tools for learning and living. MTB MLE is a gateway to a richer educational experience and that resonates with indigenous communities and prepares learners for a multilingual world. And align, alignment with the UN SDG, the quest to preserve and revitalize indigenous languages is inherent, al inherently aligned with the broader sustainable development goals set forth by the UN. It extends beyond language to encompass a dignity, identity, and cultural continuity. By giving priority to indigenous languages, we are making strides forward toward quality education, reduced inequality, and sustainable communities. This holistic approach ties linguistic sustainability to broader human development goals, interweaving the pres preservation of languages into the tapestry of global progress. The importance of indigenous languages is not limited to linguistic aspects. They are interconnected with cultural, social, and economic sustainability. By fostering these languages, we preserve cultural heritage, bolstering social bonds, and adding to economic diversity. This multifaceted approach to sustainability 
goes beyond mere environmental considerations to include a human-centered view. The vitality of indigenous languages thus contributes to the overall well-being of communities and provides a comprehensive perspective on what true sustainability entails. And collaboration with government bodies optimizes what can be achieved when various stakeholders, policymakers, authorities, and communities come together. This alignment of efforts, resources, and expertise has led to significant progress in both language preservation and education. This model of governance accentuates the importance of partnership, creating a synergy that multiplies impact and yields solution tailored to local needs, yet in alignment with broader national objective. It is a model that nurtures a cooperative spirit, setting the stage for lasting success. So I go now to uh, grassroots efforts of my indigenous organization, the Kadazandusun Language Foundation. KLF is one example of uh, grassroots initiatives and community, community engagement. Working in close relation with local communities, the foundation has revitalized indigenous languages by creating an atmosphere where tradition converges with innovation. This community-based approach illuminates how local understanding can translate into impactful outcomes, serving as a reminder that keys to linguistic preservation and revitalization lie within the communities themselves. So to end this section, ladies and gentlemen, these collaborative efforts and empowerment highlight a multifaceted approach that embraces grassroots efforts, governmental collaboration, education innovation, global alignment, and holistic sustainability. They illustrate how indigenous languages are an integral part of the broader tapestry with each trade contributing to a vibrant and resilient future for indigenous communities and humanity as a whole. The vision of the foundation is to engage the community at large to fully embrace the ethno-linguistic and cultural heritage and take up their responsibility, actively participate in the preservation, promotion, and development of the mother tongue, which is the embodiment of our linguistic and ethnic cultural identity. So we go to the next section. First, I would like to, to share about the Malaysian Indigenous People Conference on Education. So ladies and gentlemen, back in 2007, in Rampayan Laut, Kota Belud, Sabah, Malaysia, a historic event took place. It was the first Malaysian Indigenous Peoples Conference on Education, we term MIPSI. The inaugural MIPSI, MIPSI 1, originated as an intellectual endeavor by KLF and SIL Malaysia, history here, who in attended the, the World Indigenous Peoples Conference on Education, WIPSI, in Hamilton, New Zealand, from November 27 to December 1st, the year 2005. So uh, profoundly influenced by the participation in WIPC, we, I must say myself, a colleague from KLF and Jim and Carla Smith of SIL Malaysia, were inspired as we sat by the Waikato River in New Zealand, I remember. <laughs> to replicate a similar symposium aimed at raising awareness among Malaysian indigenous people on issues pertinent to indigenous education with a particular emphasis on the utilization of indigenous languages in the educational context. So con consequently, 
the structure and objective of MIPSI can be viewed as a localized adaptation to WIPSI, the WIPSI model, formulated on a, as a strategic response by stakeholders in indigenous languages, in indigenous language education to international advocacy for indigenous pedagogical practice. So from MIPSI one, uh, this is the awareness because it's the first one ever organized. It's the impact of the uh, participants. I think it's the first time our people heard about uh, MTB and uh, MLE. And uh, I would say the takeaway, see the image on the, on the right, was, the Im was imprinted in the participants' mind. Uh, done by Dennis Malone of SIL. This is uh, 2005. Yeah. So uh, I would like to highlight that after MIPSI 1, the co collaboration between SIL Malaysia and the Dayak Bidayu National Association successfully produced an ethnic language curriculum. They call it Curriculum Bahasa Ethnic KBE. So it's designed to meet uh, local demands for a standardized curriculum specifically tailored for ethnic languages. And the K KBE, uh, this aligns with the educa Malaysian Education Ministry's curriculum for existing ethnic language curriculums. We have three in Malaysia, one in Sabah, the Karazan Dusun, in um, Sarawak Iban and in Peninsula Malaysia, Semai. Now, this uh, curriculum aims to maintain, preserve cultural heritage and promote the use of indigenous languages and indigenous knowledge and are implemented in the primary and secondary school. Now with the Bidayu, uh, indigenous communities already implementing this curriculum in their heritage preschools, we are witness witnessing a real time impact. And building on MIPC1, a collaborative endeavor ensued between, again, the Dayak Bidayu National Association and UNICEF Malaysia with other stakeholders, KLF, um, University uh, Malaysia Sabah, University Malaysia Sarawak, and um, other stakeholders of indigenous languages uh, to hold the MIPC2. So, the conference brought together 282 participants and 60 academics of diverse background. Now, notable was a featured workshop called Ethno Arts in MTB MLE Material Development, which dissected the indispensable role of indigenous languages and culture in pedagogy. So out of MIPSI 2 emerged a set of resolution. Uh, these resolutions ask the government to synchronize its educational policy with respected frameworks such as the uh, UN DRIP and the Malaysian Education Act of 1996. Uh, furthermore, they urge the integration of indigenous languages into the Sustainable Development Goal Report. So in conclusion, the focus of these concerted efforts and policies are unambiguous. They underscore an unwavering commitment to preserve indigenous languages and enhance educational outcomes in these unique communities. And now let me go to the ethno arts and material development for MTB MLE. So distinguished ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues, our odyssey through the ethno arts workshop has been an enriching confluence of scholarly engagement and communal collaboration facilitated by KLF and in concert with our esteemed partners of UNICEF Malaysia, SIL International and SIL Malaysia, Pakos Trust, and a, a series of uh, four ethno arts material development workshops uh, were conducted. These workshops were especially designed for heritage language preschool educators representing 16 unique indigenous communities from diverse regions across Malaysia, including Sabah, Sarawak, and
That's why I say it's really good for uh, teaching material for indigenous children. Okay, in this context, uh, our foundation also organizes um, orthography workshop to build foundational linguistics, uh, linguistic capabilities and opening the doors for communal members to craft their own dictionaries and contribute to shared uh, repository. Right, so the, the, the last part, the grassroots heritage language program. Uh, these uh, programs has objective of language preservation, cultural continuity and uh, cognitive development. And just to show some pictures, our, our community learning center, which is an initiative aimed at communities younger generation, specifically with children uh, aged four to six years old. And uh, it's situated in the heart of the community itself. So the program serves as a pedagogical incubator fostering early childhood education in the community's language. Okay. So in a similar a spirit of community and learning, KLF recently partnered with the Office of uh, Assemblywoman Jenny Lasimbang to organize a cultural camp involving both children and their parents. It's a strategy, so I don't have to take care of the children. You bring the parents, they will help you take care of the children, and the, par the parents also learn, and then they, it's a very effective because they can continue learning together, so parents and uh, children. So, um, so it's uh, the camp serve as a, a lab for transmission of indigenous knowledge from one generation to the next. So, in the camp, like the this picture, this is just uh, one of the activity is collecting and plucking fern tips. Collecting means what part of the fern do you pick? Not the older, but the younger, the younger leaves, and then plucking. How do you pluck that as vegetable? And there were other activities like. Um, Fishing, showing them how to use a traditional fishing rod, how to fix the bait. And we also do um, fish salad, the traditional uh, food of the Kadazan people. And in the evening, we have a storytelling session. This is my mother uh, telling stories. And we also have uh, the, the other evening, two evenings, uh, learning how to sing all the uh, children's song. Okay. And next, uh, that, this one. Cultural Identity Marker Workshop, uh, actually a very, very effective uh, workshop uh, for, for our work. Uh, I attended this workshop, I don't know where back, uh, coordinated, uh, facilitated by Dr. Todd Salmon and Mary Salmon. And during uh, the workshop, uh, I learned just a little bit, but um, went back and so many workshops on cultural identity marker has uh, been conducted. And this is just um, okay, uh, a case study. Uh, this is for the Sungai Makiang, uh, the community from Saguan, Tongod, Sabah. And they chose tapioca as their cultural identity marker. And they decided that they will organize a tapioca fest where they will exhibit various uh, species of tapioca and the various types of food made from tapioca. And they want to write these down and publish them in their indigenous language. So they said, okay, we'll go back, prepare for the fest, and when you're ready, we will invite you all to, to come over to the village and have a look. So, and it was good also for us to come at the Tapioca Fest because that's where you can get good pictures for your book. So we went and um, it was very good, but I was so pleasantly surprised and actually very happy that the community redeemed their treasure costume. It has long been gone, but they're still elders and they got sponsorship from the leader and they have all these costumes here. So we're showing that um, empowering indigenous languages and indigenous knowledge has strengthened their culture. And these are the people, the children during the Tapioca Fest. And uh, this is the book that we help them publish. So that's the, it just says uh, Tapioca uh, and the recipe. So this is Two, two examples of uh, the recipe. It's very simple. It's very simple, just a beginning. Yeah? And so, um, how do these initiatives bridge the generations? Yeah. Uh, if you're asking how these efforts tie together to build connections across generations, it's this. Yeah? We are mixing the old with the new and creating 
learning experiences that everyone can be a part of through activities like our cultural camps. For example, we, may, we are making sure grandparents, parents, and children share and learn from one another. And in our conferences, for instance, we include all age old wisdom with modern teaching methods to benefit everyone. So in essence, we are weaving a strong cultural and, and educational fabric that wraps around both our elders and our youth so nobody gets left behind. Okay, so more, more uh, explicit here is to show how this um, initiative bridged the generation. So, uh, I understand you'll be getting the print out or copy of the PowerPoint. So uh, um, quickly, we just go through like for the MIPSI. Yeah, it, is, it fosters dialogues that bridge the wisdom of elders, uh, elder educators with the innovation of emerging scholars in indigenous education. It enables multi-generational collaboration in shaping equitable educational policies, making sure both elders and youth needs are considered. And for the ethno arts uh, workshop, it acts as a conduit for transmitting traditional arts and craft skills from elders to the youth. So preserving cultural heritage and uh, it engages multiple generations um, in discussions about the importance of cultural identity, thereby fostering intergenerational understanding. And for the grassroots heritage program, uh, it has community led education it's inclusive and equitable learning, um, grassroots leadership, cultural preservation, well-being through, commun through the community. And for the cultural camp, yeah, it provides a direct platform for knowledge transfer from older to younger generations, as, as you all can uh, saw in the photos just now. And also fortifying family bonds because we have parents and children attending the camp. And, and empowers both a youth and elders through shared experiences, strengthening community leadership across age group. And for the cultural identity map workshop, yeah, enable elders to share traditional methods of identity uh, expression while encouraging youth to incorporate these markers into modern context. It uh, builds a collective sense of identity that respects the wisdom of the elder uh, generation while adapting to the evolving world views of the youth. And uh, the next uh, last slide, so for bridging gender, the bridging the general concept. So I just uh, reiterate here that the act of bridging generations is central to our efforts to revitalize indigenous languages. It's about creating a dialogue between our elders who hold the wisdom of our language and our youths who hold the key to their future. So through education, mentorship and shared experiences, we are forging a connection that ensures continuity and vibrancy of our indigenous languages. It is about recognizing the wisdom and traditional knowledge of older generations and the innovative potential of younger ones. This is not just a theoretical concept. It is an actionable pathway to sustainability. Uh, for those of us uh, who were at the cultural camp, we were witnesses to this bridging of the generations and it's a soul deep, beautiful. I am sure you have similar activities that link the generations and felt immense hope for the future. So for the collaborative framework for accelerating uh, MLE across nations, my proposal for collaboration goes beyond traditional methods. We must focus on opening channels of communication, fostering understanding and working towards a spirit of true partnership. This includes joint planning, shared resources, continuous consultation with indigenous communities, and an unwavering commitment to mutual respect and shared goals. Now, in a world that, uh, where indigenous voices are often overlooked, this framework for collaboration serves as a beacon for inclusivity and cooperation. It is about building bridges, not walls, and ensuring that every stakeholder has a voice in this in the conversation. So the, the collaborative framework that I envision is not about reinventing wheels, but about synergizing efforts between nations, especially within the context of 
IDIL. Now, this framework aims to facilitate the sharing of best practices, resources, and expertise between countries that have already made significant progress in implementing MLE and those that are still in the early stage of planning or execution. So uh, this one is a uh, collaborative framework, the international joint planning, resource pooling and knowledge transfer, continuous consultation with indigenous communities and mutual respect for shared goals. And uh, in conclusion, um, okay, summary of some of the key points. Um, uh, we are at a pivotal moment in the history of indigenous languages. Together, we have dwelt into the very heart and soul of these languages and the startling reality is clear. A significant, significant portion of our uh, heritage is at risk, tethering on the brink of oblivion. But we also explored avenues of hope, understanding the wisdom within bridging generations, our robust framework for collaboration and the vital necessity of indigenous empowerment. So our dialogue today has not only been a pleading, pleading conversation, but an urgent call to action for a sustainable future. Our languages are not mere words, they are living and breathing entities that connect generations. So they resonate with the love of our ancestors and the dreams of our children. We are united in our determination to foster a world where our indigenous languages thrive as basis of culture, social and economic sustainability. Together we strive not only to preserve, but to empower, nurture and unleash the full potential of our heritage. So today in this room, we are united by a shared vision and a shared responsibility. Bridging generations is not just a theme, it is our collective mission. We are the architects of a new era where collaboration, respect, and empowerment are not mere buzzwords, but the very pillar of our success. I call on policymakers, communities, and every individual here to embrace this vision with fervor and commitment. Let us forge partnerships that honor our ancestors, empower our present, and secure a sustainable future for our indigenous languages and communities. In the, time, in the time is to act now, let us move forward hand in hand with unwavering resolve and unbreakable faith in our mission. So to end, I would just like to take this opportunity since I'm here meeting so many of uh, uh, you to thank my mentors, our network partners, our collaborators or collaborators, SIL International, SIL Malaysia, the curriculum division of our Ministry of Education, the Sabah State Government, Pakos Trust, UNICEF, and all of you here present who are working together towards bridging generation. So with that, brothers and sisters, thank you.